Hello, folks, and welcome to The Farm, a podcast dedicated to culture, parapolitics, and high weirdness in all its many forms. This is your host, Recluse, a.k.a. Steven Snyder, the longtime curator of the Visa blog and author of A Special Relationship, Trump, Epstein, and the Secret History of the Anglo-American Establishment. If you like what you hear here today, be sure to check me out at visaview.blogspot.com. That's V-I-S-U-P-V-I-E-W dot blogspot.com. And put your copy of that book and my other works at the Farm's official store, which is at the farmpodcast.store. That is the farm podcast, all one word, dot store. And please consider signing up for the Farm's Patreon. You get two additional full-length shows per month. That's between three and four hours of bonus material with exclusive guests and content. All right. I am excited for today's guest. He is currently running his very own alternate reality game, or ARG as they are known around these parts, centered around the Sirius Institute. In effect, he is trying to establish a cult to rival the official state-sanctioned ones. Certainly no other guests I've had on there have acknowledged to doing such things. So folks, I am very pleased to give you guys Lord Hugh R. A. Doombar? Shoot, I got that wrong. No, that's right. That's perfect. I did get it right. Okay, fantastic. I almost always butcher them. All right, Hugh, thank you so much for dropping by today, sir. Yeah, thanks for having me. As you guys may have gathered, this show is going to be centered around args and cults. Lord Hugh is going to break down his own as well as those that proliferate throughout modern civilization. But perhaps more importantly, we are going to address whether or not our species can be saved, and if not, how we deal with that. I mean, I'm really excited just to hear his answer for that alone. So, let us dig in. All right, so let's get into a few of the concepts that you talk about. One you mention regularly is immortality projects. Could you define that for us, please? So it really comes from um, Ernest Becker, who's a psychologist. He wrote this very seminal work called The Denial of Death. It came out in 74, and it won the Pulitzer Prize in a couple of months after he died. But that was a very influential book in terms of psychology, and it's been taken up by particularly a guy called um, Sheldon Solomon. Uh, he started a whole movement in psychology, which is called the Terror Management Theorists, and it's based on what Ernest Becker thought about uh, really the driving force in culture and in civilization, really, the whole impetus, the psychological impetus behind civilization. So he started off with Freud and Otto Rank and these kind of guys. Um, and Freud, if you remember your Freudian psychology, he had uh, this idea of eros and this kind of life force, this kind of Alain Vital. He also then came up, well, it's credited to him coming up with Thanatos, which is the death wish. Uh, it wasn't actually Freud, it was actually Susanna Spielrein. He's, he just plagiarized it from her without <laughs> acknowledging it. But uh, Ernest Becker took that idea and he said, you know, this is very profound. He said, the, the whole reason why we have a culture is because we're making up a story. We're making up this kind of immortality project, what he called a cause of sui project or you know, self-causing project. And that is our immortality vehicle. We kind of feel like if we invest in this you know, weird project, uh, that'll be our immortality. And what it does is it alleviates our death anxiety. But Ernest Becker said, everything is based on death anxiety. Uh, psycho some psychologists don't like it now because they say, well, you know, I never think about death. But what Sheldon Solomon and the terror management theory theorists have proved is that we do think about death, even though we don't know it. Uh, the very solid um, experiments that they've done and they can show things like they can get judges and uh, remind them about death. And they give almost 100% longer sentences and things like, things like that. Makes people very conservative to, to start thinking about death. So it, it is clearly established as a, a motivating force. And Ernest Becker never had, had a solution, although he, he fingered the problem. He said, this is the whole problem about our civilization and um, the, or everything we do virtually. And he uh, didn't, didn't realize that there is a long tradition that uh, goes back further than civilization, in fact, I think. And, and you know, what, what 
the solution to death anxiety and the fact that everybody has this or you know this yen for immortality this unrequited yen i uh, the solution to it is to just die early that was a well known <laughs> a well known um, remedy for it and it's a shamanic remedy and it's still you know practiced uh, you know it, it, new age guys like Eckhart Tolle and stuff they they all say it too is you you just have an ego death and so it's well known that the cure for this uh, anxiety that we have that drives culture and music and arts and uh, statehood even is uh, is really because it's a kind of an ego, uh, it's ego anxiety. And so the cure for it is to just, um, you know, uh, just die early. And that means have an ego death early. So in on Mount Athos, uh, here in Greece, I'm in Greece, but on Mount Athos, I say, you know, if you, if you die, um, if you die, oh, how does it go? If you die early, then uh, you don't die when you die. So in other words, you know, just, get over it uh, start living <laughs> you kind of uh detect uh, traces of that tradition in the um uh, the cathars i think is how it was pronounced the uh, medieval gnostic sect uh, from france yeah it's it's um the albigensians the templars it's uh it's in freemasonry it's it's brother christian it's it's the core of, uh, of all these so it's, it's very well known i'm not really sure why ernest becker um, missed it. <laughs> yes, no, I was uh, fascinated because I know they put quite an emphasis on suicide, um, especially escaping the bodily confines uh, prematurely before old age uh, did its thing. So, um, broadly speaking, how do you personally define a cult? Um, you know, you know uh, one of the uh, more interesting linkages I also noted that you made to this uh, kind of nexus was uh, multinational corporations as well, which I think is rather apt. Uh, could you go over that for us a bit? So I have a pretty broad definition of a cult. The, the a cult is normally defined. I think Margaret Singer was uh, she she's dead now, but she she was the world expert on cults, and uh, she she had this these broad definitions. But they they don't really know how to define cults accurately because you know just about everything is a cult. So uh, the the main the, the way I define a cult is from the word itself. So if you look at the root word for, for cult and culture and cultivate, uh, it's uh, from the Proto-Indo-European, uh, which is quella or quell. Now, the proto indo you've got to call them Proto-Indo-Europeans, they're really Aryans, but you're not allowed to call them that anymore because of Hitler. So you have to call them Proto-Indo-Europeans and pretend you're not talking about the Aryans, but, but you are. Um, the Aryans invented the wheel and so Quella means a hub. It means the, essentially the center of a wheel. The way to understand it is sort of like water circling a drain or if you imagine a, a you know, center of gravity like a big black, black hole with uh, these satellites orbiting it and gradually being sucked into the middle. So what the center of the black hole, hole is, is a, is a charismatic personality. And so this charismatic personality has a new idea um, as kind of normally starts with exactly like Christianity. They have a Damascus moment like uh, St. Paul did. And they suddenly have this huge epiphany. They start developing an ideology around us and they gather followers and they start breaking away from the mainstream cult or culture. Um, mainly because they think the mainstream culture is heading, heading for destruction. And so you, once you say, well, you know, okay, if, if a cult is just a collective of people with the same ideology with, uh, you know, started by some charismatic leader, well, then like Steve Jobs is a cult leader and so is Elon Musk. And, <laughs> and eventually you start saying, well, hang on a minute, Henry Ford's a, a, a cult leader. And, and when you look at it, any entrepreneur that starts a company uh, is doing an Ernest Becker style immortality project. You know, it's like if you look at Elon Musk, it's like, oh, we're going to be a multi-planet species. And it's it's an immortality narrative. And he's the charismatic leader at the center of it. So, uh, yeah, I think that is almost the collective of humans. It's the intellectual collective uh, noun for humans is cults. 
and so that's you know a whole civilization is a cult and culture yeah i mean it's uh, really fascinating i know when you had uh, pointed that out in some of your talks it uh, definitely kind of brought some interesting perspectives um on my own work environment um I can certainly see now why people find uh, my rather cavalier attitude towards my job to be so offensive. <laughs> I didn't uh, quite buy into everything, and um, that's that's not uh, a good uh, position to be in for the diehards. <laughs> yeah, well, if you in most corporations, especially in a U.S. corporation, you will find all the dynamics of a cult. So they don't psychologists don't like to call things cults because it's pejorative now they call them new religions or uh, some people like Stephen Hazen who, who who's a kind of a deprogramming he likes to call himself a cult deprogrammer but those guys might call it a destructive cult but uh, you know the oldest joke in I think um, religious studies or comparative religion is that you know cult plus time equals religion so the only difference between all the major religions today is the, that they've been around for a while, but they, they all started off exactly like any cult, the, like the Moonies or the Marshall Applewhite or you know, David Koresh. All of them are starting movements that if they didn't wind up in flames or <laughs> ending rather disastrously, would have turned into uh, religions like Christianity, you know, 2000 years down the road. And the same applies to any corporation. You, you know, the Carnegie Mellon, these guys, they, they, had Mellon, they started institutes to carry on their name and work and their ideology. And those things can be extremely long lived. Yeah. It was kind of fascinating. I'm, I'm thinking of George Peabody, I believe, um, specifically, because here in the States, we've got these, you know, these Peabody auditoriums and things like that everywhere. And you just, you saw the name constantly. And I never made any kind of association to it until much later in my life. And it's like, wow, this guy basically has these shrines. I mean, literally all over the country to his legacy. Um, yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, now, I mean, Rockefeller was one too. He, he uh, oh, yes. Yeah, there, there, there are many, many of these guys that, you know, um, have a cult following. Yeah. Well, I think actually the best argument for humanity's extinction uh, would be to ensure that uh, there will not be a religion based around Elon Musk or uh, the Rockefeller family in a thousand years. Yeah, that we would, can only hope. <laughs> that would just be terrible. But I mean, think about it. If, if Elon Musk's uh, plan actually came to fruition and we started a yeah. colony on Mars, he would, he would be, be recognized as a kind of Moses, right? Wouldn't he? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, my Lord. All right. Now, um, you referred to our dominant global culture as a death cult. Could you please elaborate on that? So the thing about cults, and this is why I doing this is why I'm doing my project is they all destructive. So uh, that's not generally recognized. I think that some people think there's such a thing as a benign cult. So if you think of say Steve Jobs and Apple, you think, well, what's wrong with that? That's never gonna turn into you know, Jonestown. And I think that's wrong. I think it is. And the reason is that the dynamics of a cult seem to become the opposite in the end. So I think mainstream psychologists think that cults are generally ap apocalyptic. Uh, the, the general idea is that they assume the end of the world is nigh and they have an immortality project to avoid the fate of, of the, the majority. And then in so doing, they actually snuff themselves out earlier than the majority. So they have the same dynamic of the cult that they're trying to escape from and in trying to escape from it, they set up exactly the same dynamic that caused the original cults uh, to go extinct and or become destructive. So, so our major cult is, you know, the mainstream Western industrial culture. And we, we're very keen on that. We're very keen on machines and we you know, futurologists and kind of uh, millenarian uh, hopefuls. Uh, and so it doesn't seem apocalyptic, but the, if you look closely, it says Marshall Applewhite or Jim Jones, or those guys also start out on a very positive note. It becomes apocalyptic later when they lose hope. 
So that's why I think our mainstream culture or cult is in a dangerous position because it's very hopeful now, while you know everybody believes that we're all gonna have the singularity of the nerds and we're gonna be a multi-planet species and it's all, you know, AI is gonna you know, solve all our problems and all this ludicrous thinking. When people realize it isn't gonna happen and they realize the Arctic is melting, the planet is really, you know, heading for ecological catastrophe, they flip and they become extremely nihilistic to the point where there's a track record of these guys, particularly like in Jonestown, uh, you know, turning on their followers and uh, saying, you know, the, just out of spite for the world, they just take as many people down with them um, as they can. And I think that that's, you know, that's a big risk for our global mainstream culture. And uh, I can just give you an example. Um, take, for instance, the Mormons, which is, you know, uh, Joseph Smith's cult. Oh, I love to talk about Mormons. Please do. <laughs> well, uh, did you know that in the missile bunkers in the U.S., and I think they're probably about 2,000, that they preferentially select Mormons. And the reason is that they did tests and they found that most people, when it came to the crunch in the simulation, which they, they thought was an actual real event, a real um, nuclear war scenario, they wouldn't launch the missiles, they bottled up. They found that uh, Mormons didn't because Mormons are looking forward to the rapture. And there's some bit in the Book of Mormon, I think, uh, you have to fact check me on this, but there's something about fire from heaven and the missiles and so, um, uh, th basically what they interpret as nuclear weapons raining down from heaven. So they are more than eager to actually launch nuclear we weapons to bring on the second coming of Christ. And I think it's just absolutely, <laughs> it's one of the most scary things I've ever, ever yeah, heard. Yeah, no, it's... As a missile bunkers. Well, there's like a, I mean, pretty much a whole full-blown like ancient astronaut cult, I mean, within the church, or at least I'm convinced of it. I mean, I don't know if you've uh, ever really followed any of like the UFO disclosure nonsense, but I mean, the Mormons are massive funders for just all of this kind of stuff and this, you know, zero point energy technology that... Uh, is going to eliminate uh, carbon fuels and that type of thing. It's uh, it's rather absurd. I, you know, they they have a, a war chest of two hundred billion, so they they have incredible resources. And um, but I, I think Mitt, Mitt Romney was going to inherit that two hundred billion. It, uh, they they I think in the in the last um, election that he stood in. There's this uh, prophecy of the pale horse, and they said, you know, that Mitt Romney is the pale horse, and uh, they were going to give him the 200 billion war chests um, so that as prime minister, I mean, president, he could um, basically do his uh, apocalyptic <laughs> thing in the end times. He could bring on the end times. So um, I don't, you know, I don't think many people knew that. Uh, lots of people voted for Mitt Romney in, in that election that he stood. Um, and uh, most people think, oh, the Mormons are some kind of flavor of Christians, but they, 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 they're not. They think that, um, that God lives on a uh, planet close by called Kolob. Yeah, and I mean, they, they believe the devil and uh, Yahweh are brothers. Uh, or no, Jesus and uh, the devil are brothers. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they, um, I mean, in a lot of ways, they're closer to Scientology, I think, than a lot of people realize. Um, but it's kind of interesting, too, because the Mormons seem to go out of their way to, like, infiltrate other cults as well. I mean, I don't know if you're aware, but they had quite a presence in Nexium, especially in the uh, the Mexican branch of it. Um, here in the States, too, they've made a lot of inroads with the, uh, you know, the Christian identity cults and what have you for years. So that's kind of another interesting dynamic of them as well. Yeah, I, an interesting footnote. I, I worked for an um, as a contractor for um, a, Mo a Mormon company that did software for the Navy, and I got fired from there because I said that uh, the Mormon Church was a cult. <laughs> they fired me on the spot. <laughs> yeah. 
no it's, it's kind of the other thing i've never really gotten pushback about much of the stuff that i posted over the years but yeah i mean almost anything that drags the mormons into it i get flamed like you wouldn't know what it's very interesting <laughs> all right so you proposed a uh, seven a seven stage life cycle for a conventional death cult so what are those stages so, yeah, I, I was uh, just making a, a lot of this stuff um, I do is trolling and just kind of spoofing. The idea is to not create certainty, it's to create uncertainty. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I'm just flubbing, really. It's just uh, just uh, having having a bit of a laugh. But there is some seriousness to that seven stage. Um, the reason why I picked seven stages is because of uh, Pythagoras. So Pythagoras was running a cult. Um, and um, the Pythagoreans were, were definitely a cult. And the, uh, he, they believed in the octave. You know, Pythagoras is supposed to have discovered the octave. Um, I was in a cult. My, the formative years in, in, um, in my life was in a cult that, that traced, or they said that uh, they traced their ancestry back to the mystery schools and in particular Pythagoras. Um, so, and it came all the way through Gurdjieff and Gurdjieff school and Gurdjieff was very big on the octave and seven. Marsilio Ficino, you know, who was really the kind of guru to the De Medici's um, uh, Botticelli and those guys. And so uh, you can see lots of references to sevens in say Botticelli's, uh, no, the, um, uh, what was the uh, uh, spring um, uh, Botticelli? Um, the rites of spring, yeah, that's that's a trip. Uh, it's a, a big panel with with seven stages, and what's hidden in there is is the octave. So I just took the seven stages. Now, the important thing in this octave progression, which is supposed to be spiritual development, uh, this kind of you know seven chakras kind of idea, I. An important thing there is something which I think is quite valid, and that's they say on on the third note, so between the third note and the fourth note, there's a semitone as there is in the Western octave, and they always said in the cult that I was in that there needs to be a kind of a step change to actually bridge that semitone. It's often a an external shock or some kind of separate serendipity, but like a the, grace note. Yeah, exactly. It's it's kind of a, that. Um, it's a discontinuity. So you can't just start a cult and just you know head to the stars. You, you will get some kind of um, stasis, and that's so. If you think of it like do re mi, that mi is kind of strong and it's egotistical. Just the mi is a, is almost a joke that it's you know it's very self centered, but it's it's not going to actually. Uh, progress there's a kind of sticking point now something can happen externally some kind of shock or um, so, uh, many things but normally not from the leader itself but from external circumstance and that kind of needs to happen to go from do re mi fa so to to make that uh that's good so i wanted to um put, uh, you know highlight that and the other thing is um the 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 end of those seven stages and the end is kind of like Heraclitus said that everything becomes its opposite in the end so the the in the end uh at the after the heyday of the cult which is say let's say the sixth note uh the the seventh uh, or the sixth note is kind of where where things start to get complicated uh the seventh note is where things start to unravel and then that that becomes the destructive part but I do believe it. It always tends towards that uh, destructive part, and it's it's not. It's just almost a joke, really, to divide it up into seven. It's but uh, those are the only two points I was trying to get across, and just just making that seven seven scale division. Oh, it was a good joke, no doubt. Yeah, because it riffs off so many things with seven. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like kind of thinking of seven sleepers too, and that type of stuff. So yeah. Um, I have a curiosity. I know you, you seem to have a lot of these, um, you know, kind of occultic uh, things, uh, you know, um, illusions, I guess, throughout the Sirius Institute thing. Well, of course, the name itself, Sirius. Um, I was just kind of wondering how much of that was kind of tongue in cheeky. It's, it's all tongue in cheek, actually. 
um, the whole point, it's an alternate reality game. So the whole point is that you shouldn't be able to guess where it's going. I'm kind of giving the game away, <laughs> but um, it should keep people guessing. And the idea it, it is for social change and evolution, uh, personal development. So the, the idea is that if people cannot guess what it's about, if it's a cult or a recruiting program for maybe the military, or if it's just a joke, um, if it keeps people off guard, you can actually make a lot of progress uh, changing their beliefs and culture. Um, we, you see, if you try and convince something, somebody of something rationally, their defenses immediately go up and all their blinders go up and they start getting entrenched in their own ideology and they start arguing with you. But if, if they have nothing to argue with and they're kind of you know, mesmerized, while they mesmerize, while their intellect is mesmerized, you can start doing you know, brain surgery on them <laughs> in the subliminal and um, in their unconscious side. So that's, that's the reason why a lot of it looks tongue in cheek. But if whatever the arg becomes, if, if somebody said, oh, well, this is just tongue in cheek, then you quickly have to move to prove them wrong. So that would keep them guessing, if you see what I mean. Oh yeah, no, I, I just thought the tone for everything on the website for the Serious Institute was just perfect. Um, I mean, it's got that kind of comedic flair, but I mean, obviously there was also a lot of thought that was put into, you know, the introduction and some of the other things as well. Um, it was very impressive, uh, but we'll get to that in a second here. Um, so could you cover your involvement with the Extinction Rebellion movement for a moment and uh, the various players that had their sights on it? Ah, uh, yeah, that's interesting. So. I latched on to Extinction Rebellion almost as soon as they started in 2018. And the reason is, uh, it's they really what I'd characterize as quite a weak movement. So again, a cult, they are, they are a cult, they would, anybody would, uh, would say they fit the criteria for a cult. They were started by Roger Hallam and Gail Bradbrook, who were charismatic cult leaders. And they have their own ideology and their own culture. You know, they kind of, instead of clapping, they do jazz hands and things like that, which, which comes from Oxford University, I think, but no, nobody outside the UK, I think, knows that. It just looks like a creepy cultish thing that they do. Um, do you know what I mean by the jazz hands thing? It's like what a one-handed clap, right? Or something like that. I uh, know. So it's, it's really from Oxford University, I think, did some research and Apparently, people that are autistic um, really get upset by pe people applauding. So the movement in general, and I think at Oxford University, they instead they just silently wave their hands, you know, like jazz hands, like the jazz jazzing. And so that's you know, you see them on videos, you know, kind of like shaking their hands, and that's the substitute for silent clapping. Um, oh, it was from Oxford. <laughs> Yeah, it looks very creepy um, and it's not a very good re recruiting technique <laughs> because most people think it's a bit off-putting. But uh, yeah, they don't know the autistic co um, connection, so it, it just looks like these are weird, creepy people. Um, but anyway, the, uh, the, the movement, I'd say, is, is weak, and that's because uh, it's ide ideologically it's not very well-founded. And um, and the Roger Hallam was ousted, you know, the, the major founder and really the center of the organization was was actually booted out for <clears throat> silly reasons. Um, and so a number of people, not only me, figured out, well, this movement is going to die out. A lot of people in it came from Occupy. And so we started circling like vultures all thinking the same thing is that when uh, this kind of hits the dirt, um, a lot of people are going to be upset and frustrated. And that's kind of uh, our rich pickings is looking for people that are um, uh, really radicalized. So we thought it was, it's a great introduction into particularly climate change and rebellion. Um, and, uh, you know, when it all fizzled out, there would probably be a cadre of people that were radicalized by the experience and then we'd try and recruit them. And the number of people figured this out. So everything from the Socialist Workers uh, Socialist Workers Front, I think the Socialist Workers Party in, in the UK, 
a lot of communists uh, were were in the agitating and infiltrating um, anarchists um, and uh, yeah. Uh, so so I don't know if uh, your listeners know about about alternate reality gaming, but uh, there is the concept of movement jacking or game jacking. So the easiest thing, it's it's quite difficult to start up an alternate reality game, but it's much easier to just uh, hijack somebody else's once once it's successful in going. Um, and so a lot of people had that idea. And so it's it's proven, uh, yeah, reasonably, reasonably correct. I mean, the my prediction for the trajectory was correct. Um, and I have actually recruited a few radical people out of it. So, so I considered it worth, worth my time lurking <laughs> around, around them. And um, the other thing about them is they do a lot of costume, you know, sort of cosplay stuff. Uh, and so that's also useful for an alternate reality game, which has the concept of LARPing or live action role playing. So the fact that they like that and appeals to the target audience is also useful. But the idea is to just game jack it. So, you know, I have a parallel website to their website and claim it's a free speech zone for Extinction Rebellion. But the idea is just to um, A, try and radicalize them while they're still around and then B, when it all, you know, craters to try and uh, recruit um, the, the radical uh, disaffected <laughs> remainder of them. What's your, uh, your take out of uh, curiosity on Occupy Wall Street? It kind of seems like a lot of these movements like Extinction Rebellion and QAnon and a lot of the other kind of big ones during this past decade grew out of the, the Occupy movement initially. Yeah, the, I mean, the, um, it's, it's an ecosystem of rebellion. So Micah White is really credited with starting Occupy, but also um, uh, Graeber was also a part of it. Um, and various kind of perennial disaffected um, radicals uh, were, were, were instrumental in it. The problem with all these movements is that they infiltrated very quickly. I think I heard one estimate that there were almost 5,000, I think, FBI agents in, in Occupy. And the same is in true in Extinction Rebellion. So very early on um, in their formation, they got advice on how to do a rebellion from um, this woman called um, Erica Chenoweth. And er Erica Chenoweth is she works for the State Department in the U.S. And so basically the, the oh, whole yes, movement, yes. in effect, became a COINTEL prop. Uh, um, uh, you know, it's basically a, a peaceful movement to just drain um, real rebellion out of, out of the youth. So it, it becomes um, really a safety valve. And that's what, what they intended for, is a nonviolent safety valve just to keep uh, radical people in check. And that's what happened to Occupy. It, it, it goes all the way back to the battle in Seattle. The, it was completely in, infiltrated and the guys would made, you know, the, the violent acts that were done were actually um, uh, government uh, um, plans actually. So the, and the, the entire movement was steered, I mean, literally steered. There were police that directed marches and uh, there was one thing I heard of where this guy uh, realized, oh no, there's a police uh, station coming up ahead. This is going to get ugly. So he just said, you know, he just stands in the middle of the road with a bullhorn saying, yeah, yeah, go this way, go this way. And all the people wander like sheep <laughs> in the direction. So they, they work to steer it, um, to keep it peaceful. And then I think in at the end of Occupy, I imagine it was people that infiltrated it that said, you know, oh, well, we've done our job and now we all go home and we take what we've learned back to the suburbs. And it's it's all uh, completely fake. Um, yeah, it's all it's all engineered. Yeah, certainly, uh, that's what it appears more and more like every day. <laughs> um, all right, now you uh, may have found a solution to the failings of all breakaway cults, namely them having the seeds of their own destruction sewn in. Now, central to this concept is uh, the alternate reality game, which we've been alluding to a little bit already. So when did you first become aware of the art concept and why did it speak to you so strongly? So I was looking for a way to do social change. 
so, so basically uh, social engineering, the same as Gail Bradbrook and and um, and Hallam, uh, Roger Hallam. So, I the idea is to to get symmetry breaking because you you know you get this uh, two party politics and it goes absolutely nowhere. You know the right and the left just duke it out and it it effectively winds up just being uh, stasis and business as usual. So. I was thinking how to actually get uh, symmetry breaking and in culture and get people to reach a tipping point so that we have a cultural tipping point with, it, with the aim of you know, avoiding uh, global catastrophe for climate change and things like that. So um, I was mulling over a few ideas when I uh, researching various things when I came across the, the movie, the, the Institute. It's it's not the 27 movie, 2017 movie. It's um, it was 2013. It was done by uh, this guy, I think Stephen Jeff McCauley. Hall and um, Spencer McCall. Jeff Hall, yes, yeah, Spencer McCauley and Je Jeff Hall. Yes. That's right. So I think Jeff Hall did it as uh, from 2008. He he raised ten thousand dollars, and that recruited 10,000 people and uh, they made the Institute movie as a spoof documentary. I don't think it was a real documentary, it was kind of part of the, the ARG itself. Now, when I was watching that movie, I, I kind of vaguely got interested in ARGs uh, from you know, everything from Ong's hat and from original things. I was, I was thinking there might be some potential, but my Damascus moment was uh, when in that 2013 movie, The Institute, uh, they riff off the planet elsewhere, which I stole wholesale uh, for the Sirius Institute and I plagiarized it. I have the planet elsewhere and the planet nowhere is kind of future scenarios for where our planet can head for. Um, but the, I didn't mind, you know, plagiarizing their thing because their planet elsewhere actually comes from Isaac Asimov. It has a further history. But anyway, mid this documentary they interviewing one of the 10,000 people that they actually recruited and in, in, um, indi indicted, indicted? Um, uh, in, indoctrinated um, initiated <laughs> into this um, into this thing called the Jejun Institute which was uh, this the central kind of MacGuffin of the ARG uh, so they're interviewing this girl and she is talking about the planet elsewhere and she says, you know, I know the planet elsewhere doesn't exist. I know it's all fake, but I just wish there was a place like that that existed. And she suddenly burst into tears. And I was just, you know, like uh, the producers, like, oh, there's our Hitler. <laughs> so I thought that, you know, I thought, hey, can you imagine a product that's marketed that's, you know, your customers actually broke into tears just talking about and I suddenly realized the power actually in it and I immediately realized the connection to cults and, and that and so so then I thought that's it I'll uh, an arg is the way to go so from uh, from that moment I've been working you know I actually since 2012 before then I've been working on on an alternate reality game um, it's very difficult to explain the concept to people and uh, and so uh, you know, it's, it hasn't been all that collaborative. It's been mainly me um, on and off. But the uh, what's happened recently is, you know, uh, QAnon came along and did exactly the kind of rebellion <laughs> that I was planning. So since QAnon, it's become very easy to say, you know, an alternate reality game and the, the power of it, because now everybody knows. But I, I saw really in that uh, Jejun Institute and that's, Institute movie that you could actually change people into sort of Manchurian candidates where you could actually do a rebellion exactly as we saw in uh, January the 6th this year. Um, unfortunately, now that it's been done, uh, you know, it's everybody realizes the power and the, uh, the opposite problem is people are, are, are gaslit and a bit scared of the concept. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I've been working on QAnon uh, since 2012, my version of QAnon. Um, and I, more on the left wing than the right wing or, or neither political divide. But yeah, QAnon managed to do what I did in that time in um, 
in two years, um, but they had about 14 million in funding. And that's the problem with, with my thing is, is, um, is funding. I, I've just been using my own capital over the years um, to actually do it. Yeah, it's, it's always kind of interesting with the, the funding for some of this stuff. I mean, I don't mean to throw shade on the Jejun uh, setup, but um, I know some of my um, friends who live in the, uh, the Bay Area were rather perplexed as to how he could have afforded uh, some of those uh, properties that they were using for the ARG on the uh, reported budget that they had. So, um, and then I don't know if you saw in Bright Axiom, which was the ARG that uh, they did afterwards, but I mean, there's like the kind of whole setup where they go into Northern California in the middle of the woods and they discover this almost full blown cultic ceremony in progress with just, I mean, just hiring all the actors for that kind of stuff and just, it would have required a little bit of coin, I think. Uh, yeah, you can do these things on a shoestring. I've been doing it on a shoestring. Well, certainly, but, yeah, yeah, but this, uh, it definitely seemed like they had some real production values with this stuff, though. Yeah, um, you see, the thing is, you again, you've got to get started. If you get started, then uh, people can creep out of the woodwork, and I mean everything from, like, state actors like Russia <laughs> and China, North Korea, can can step out and, and start funding you through through various channels. Uh, the reason why they do it is uh, it's it's called active measures in Russia, but it's it's from um, Boris Sarkov who who did this very effectively in the Ukraine and Georgia. Um, but it's it's a standard psyops procedure. So QAnon was done uh, by ex-military people and some actually still in the military. Uh, and but it's it's a standard psyops um, uh, that goes back to techniques learnt in the 1950s. And if you want to go really far back um, to Eddie Bernays and the OSS in the First World War. Well, I mean, isn't it? I mean, isn't the ARG set up in and of itself effectively, though, a kind of gamification of psychological warfare? I mean, my understanding is um, with the disinformation campaign or active measures, as you're referring to, it's kind of similar where you would start by planning something in an obscure newspaper and then you'd let it get around a little bit, then gradually introduce it maybe to some more mainstream publications. And it's a little bit similar with an ARG where maybe you start it with like a mysterious email and then just kind of gradually build it up a little bit. Yeah, they throw a lot of mud against the wall to see what sticks. So it's it's very hard to determine up front what will go viral. But if you keep on throwing mud at the wall, you will hit hit on something. But I mean, it's it's you know even if even dirty tricks campaigns for political parties like uh, Michael Gove and stuff did did all these kind of techniques in in a moderate way. Um, but done on the scale that they do them in Russia is really designed to uh, com completely confuse, uh, the divide and confuse the enemy. So the, the general idea of a PSYOPs is, is uh, really uh, dissolution or, or cohesion. So uh, you want to make sure that your side is cohesive. And again, in terms of a cult, that they stick uh, around the hub or the queller of the, of the core story, then you want to break the, uh, the enemy's uh, version of a cult. And so then you, you want to divide and conquer and uh, confuse. And, and so it's, it's dissociation is what you're trying to get there. So for example, Boris Sarkov would uh, fund you know, far right groups and far left groups. Um, then the amazing thing is, he wouldn't do it undercover. He, he went and said, I've tried, I'm funded both. <laughs> and you say, well, why would he admit that? And the reason is because then nobody knows what to believe. And that's the ultimate, the ultimate aim is so that nobody trusts anything and nobody knows what to believe. It's a fog of war kind of thing. Okay, and another interesting thing about uh, Jejun I kind of wanted to get into here for a second before we move on also is just sort of the progression to how they've done it. Um, you know, originally it started as an ARG in the Bay Area, and then from there it kind of became this Fox documentary that you were referring to. And then most recently they actually turned it into a full-blown fictional uh, miniseries, Dispatch Us From mm -hmm. Elsewhere. 
So it's almost kind of going full circle from being something based in reality to being almost like a full blown fictional presentation. But then you have this this earlier material that kind of further blurs the lines. Yeah, the, I can't remember who the guy who did the AMC dispatches from elsewhere. Um, the, but he he started oh. in his dark on this. Yeah. Uh, but but he he did exactly the same thing as I did. He watched that uh, Institute movie in uh, in twenty thirteen, and he uh realized the the potential for it so he took took it and made a the dispatches from elsewhere mc miniseries but it's it's turning the whole thing into a commercial franchise rather than the original intent which is really it's supposed to be subversive and more guerrilla um, but if a, if an arc takes off it it can become its 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 own um it's its own game jack in other words so the number of args which were like cicada 3301 which apparently were game jacked by the original <laughs> founders so it's possible that you could get a, a you know the amc um dispatches from elsewhere and movement jack that and and, and basically leverage it so that there's this continual one-upmanship kind of thing all right, I'm going to flip the questions here for a second, because I think this one will work a little better before we get into your uh, ARG and Ernest. Um, so could you get into the influence that cybernetics have had on you? Yeah, well, a uh, huge amount. So, yeah, the, the cybernetics and the cyberneticists like John von Neumann and these guys are very, very influential in the 20th century, not very well known. Um, I don't know why they're not part of mainstream consciousness, but they gave... Well, I would say that's activity. because, I mean, most of Western civilization is really organized wrong, cybernetic principles, so um, yeah, like it's kind of like we don't want you to kind of see how we actually run things type of thing. Well, yeah, exactly. So, the, I mean, just to, in case people don't know, it was people like uh, Margaret Mead, Gregory Bates, and uh, these, they were... Margaret Mead was um, an anthropologist and they they had they set up the world we live in um, in a lot more ways than than is given credit by the, the average bear. Um, the a large part of what the cyberneticists were about and what I'm about too is uh, feedback. So uh, it's filter feedback mechanisms. In, in fact, uh, I think it was John von Neumann that really was the genesis of uh, the feedback principles. He introduced the cyberneticists and the uh, Macy Foundation uh, to, to the principle of, of feedback. Um, and just to show you how impressed they were, Margaret Mead broke a tooth. When, when she first heard about feedback, she, she was so excited that she, she bit down so hard that she broke a tooth in the middle of the uh, presentation. No, um, von, um, von, von Neumann, right? Neumann. Neumann, yeah. Neumann. He was the one who came up with game theory too, right? Or uh, helped. Uh, well, no, Schelling. So okay, okay. Schelling was also part of the Macy Foundation. So they, they it's very uh, closely internet. So Nash, the Nash equilibrium, people think of the prisoner's dilemma and that is Nash, but that was actually Schelling. But these guys are all from the Macy Foundation and they set up, you know, in the RAND organization and these other think tanks, they set up um, mutually assured destruction. The whole way we fought the Cold War um, was done based on the thinking that came out of these guys. So they, they almost brought the world to destruction. Um, so it's incredible that we don't know about them. But uh, the, also, too, for, a lot of the um, the MK Ultra and Project Artichoke type stuff was an outgrowth of this as well. Yes, that all came out of it. Uh, the LSD research, they were all fringes. Um, they, they were the core of a lot of splinter movements um, that were very influential. But the one that, that impresses me a lot is um, Claude Shannon and information theory, because you know, I've spent a career in software. But uh, Claude Shannon. Uh, showed the cybernetics in the Macy Foundation this, he had this little mechanical rat, very advanced for its time in the 50s, and it, it was called Theseus, and it would learn uh, to navigate a maze, um, amazing for considering the computing of the time, 
And so he demonstrated to, to them uh, what really impressed them a lot was he showed them how the, the thesis, this little mechanical rat, would um, sometimes get caught in a loop inside the maze. So it would start basically get, tra get trapped in its, in its circuit and just go round and round. And a lot of these guys were psychologists and psychiatrists, and they immediately said, oh my God, what you've done is you've mechanically recreated a neurosis. So they took that idea of uh, closed feedback and uh, you know, basically circling thoughts basically or circling ideas and they, as, as, a, as the model for neurosis. So they, that was the first time that anybody made any theoretical breakthrough into what a neurosis actually was since maybe Freud and, and Jung and people like that, Bluhler and, and, and those uh, psychiatrists. So it, it was very epochal and they all took all those things and, and used them for crowd control and manipulation. Um, heinous stuff, <laughs> but it is all related to, to an ARG. Um, and then eventually when it got to Russia and uh, active measures on Sarkov, he was actually uh, just extending principles that were developed in the West and particularly in America. Now, is part of your fascination with ARGs uh, related to cybernetic principles? Because, I mean, I know from my kind of understanding of cybernetics, you have the, the two uh, kinds of feedback loops, your negative and your positive, with negative being system sustaining and positive uh, being essentially chaotic. It kind of seems to me like with an ARG or, you know, some of the predecessors like Discordianism, like what can be so subversive about them is that they essentially train people how to create positive feedback loops. Yeah, so, so if you look at the crest on the Sirius Institute, uh, if you look at it in detail, it has the whole principle in there. And what it has is an electronic feedback circuit. So uh, filter feedback is, is a very, very powerful principle. In fact, uh, if you look on my YouTube channel, I've, I've developed a whole theory you know, that's anti-Darwinian to say that it's not Darwin's mechanism is not really the mechanism that nature's using for evolution. It's really filter feedback. Um, and so once you start on the path of filter feedback, uh, you realize that a kind of mathematics or algorithmic intelligence emerges from it. And this is why where it starts to get kind of esoteric and culty because there's, there's long been this idea that there's an emergent intelligence. So if you look at these cults, uh, they generally have a theme and the theme is uh, the superorganism. It's the same thing as say the Matrix and the Minkowski sisters. You remember the unpopular later movies on <laughs> the Matrix where you have this collective intelligence and hive mind. It's continually rediscovered like James Surowiecki and the wisdom of crowds and you know that. Um, Gödel Escherbach and uh, Hofstadter, they, there's this continual idea, even Galton um, came up with this idea that there's this emergent superintelligence. In fact, even Joseph Smith and Ricardo, the, the invisible hand of the market is exactly this, this uh, concept. It was known in, uh, in ancient times, uh, more like in uh, ancient Greece as uh, Igore, I think it is, Egregor, Egregor, I think that's right. But it's well worth looking up Egregor. Uh, and what it, what it means is that uh, if you allow these systems to evolve through filter feedback, uh, then a super organism emerges out of them. So there are kind of two tracks here. One is uh, the one that we live in the Western world, which is Joseph Smith and capitalism. And that's uh, Joseph Smith said, when, when everybody's selfish, if the, you know, the baker and the brewer selfishly go about the little thing, it all works out because- By the way, I believe you mean people... Adam Smith, not Joseph Smith. Adam Smith, yeah. The, the I, thought, oh, I, think, I thought you said Joseph Smith for a second. That's what, it was oh, kind of... I, I, I meant Adam Smith. I meant the economist, you know. So yeah, 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 yeah. It, it's pretty funny, though, putting Joseph Smith in there, though, you got to admit. I, uh, that was a Maybe Freudian a bit of a Freudian slip, slip there. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, so the idea that uh, Smith had was that if everybody's selfish, then, you know, it all works out. Um, and that's kind of the, that's, uh, you know, neo neoclassical uh, neoliberalism and uh, you know, the, the world we live in is, is Joseph Smith. 
But what all these esoteric traditions said was it's the opposite. If everybody loses their ego, then uh, you get this uh, super organism. Uh, so, so Hobbes's Leviathan is the one where everybody's selfish. So everybody's selfish, but they have this mutual contract with each other. Now, all this, the esoteric tradition said, well, if everybody loses their ego, then you get the super organism emerging in the super intelligence. And you can actually see it emerge if you spend enough time, you know, working with um, cybernetics and, and feedback systems. Uh, even with slime molds, you can start to see this uh, emergent behavior. What I think is, is underneath it all, the scientific principle underneath it all is, um, uh, Emmy Noto's symmetry, Emmy Noto was an, uh, a physicist um, in the 20th century, also really forgotten, but very important. And um, so it's, it's symmetries. And then the other thing is um, Maupertuis least action. So everything is trying to economize in this kind of um, principle of least action. And the net result is something that looks like intelligence as it emerges. So a lot of these cults are saying, you know, uh, it's Cicada 3301 and Project 89, they're, they're saying we're evolving to the sort su super intelligence. Um, and the, that's, that's why it's super intelligent is because of this uh, economy of efficiency or Maupertuis least action. Yeah, it kind of reminds me a bit of um, the whole concept of the mastermind group that uh, Napoleon Hill, I believe, had conceived of around the 1930s or so. But it was kind of the same thing where you're deliberately bringing together individuals to sort of craft this uh, kind of collective uh, intelligence out of what the group will, uh, you know, be composed of. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There, there are lots of threads of it, um, but it's it's reinvented over and over again. Yeah. All right, so get into the Sirius Institute and uh, the disrupt, oh gosh, what is it again? The Sirius Institute, Institute yeah. Or no, no, the uh, the Extinctionata. Oh, uh, the ex uh, Desiderata Extinctionati. So- Extinctionati, okay. Yeah, so, so part of our group is, uh, we all doomers. So um, I came to the conclusion in 2018 that my whole project isn't, uh, isn't going to work because I think we passed all the tipping points. I think we were all doomed. <laughs> so I, I was trying to do activism and trying to join a lot of other people doing exactly the same thing. Um, just do my my bit of it. But um, I realized in 2018, there's there's no way we can reach a psychological tipping point. I mean, people are just too far behind the curve of where the world is at. Um, and uh, in, in particularly, you, you know, in the Arctic and where we, we are in terms of eco-destruction is by the time people wake up and react, it's, it's way, way too late. So I think we're headed for near-term, possibly near-term human extinction, but we're certainly headed for a, a near-term collapse. And so, yeah, it kind of depressed me a lot in, after 2018, but, but I realize now that uh, I still have something to offer people because you know, there's people are a little bit lost. And I feel that this is, I, you know, lived through South Africa, and so we, we came close to going over the brink there. So I feel like I have something to offer. And so we started this uh, group called the Extinctionati, basically the Illuminati, but guys that are all doomers, I think we all screwed. And the, uh, the Desiderata Extinctionati, it's just 12 principles to, to hang our ideas on. So we developed these 12 principles. And uh, yeah, so we meet every every Sunday, and we uh, online, and we're busy, you know, developing the principles, um, and kind of working on ourselves, and working in the wider world to you know create a rebellion. And what are these uh, twelve principles? Uh, so they well, I hope none of my flock are listening. I actually tricked everybody. They I. Uh, I, came, I came up with 12 um, desiderata, basically things that are desirable in, in people. But um, I, I asked everybody to, you know, collectively come up with 12 principles and they did, but they were all things like, you know, heal the divide and, you know, start permaculture and, you know, go vegan and 
Jordan Peterson style, you know, be nice to cats and stuff. And it was like all garbage. <laughs> so, so um, but I steered everything, manipulated everything. I, I don't, I think I got away with it. I don't think anybody noticed that I, you know, the, the final uh, outcome of all these deliberations was exactly Are you what putting I this on your YouTube page? Uh, they, they are on the Sirius Institute. If you just look at the in the menu on the left hand side, it's, uh, it's you can see uh, what the 12 are. The most important one is, is the first one, and that's uh, Know Thyself. And that's pretty much the indictment uh, for all these cults, uh, all the mystery cults, but you know, back to uh, the ancient Egyptian ones and you know, it's, it, the it, uh, Delphi. Um, you can see the over the Praneus is uh, the inscription is know thyself. Um, and so, yeah, so the, that's the most important thing. Uh, part of the result of knowing yourself is, is ego death. Um, and then they run all the way through, they kind of things that are really kind of neutral, you know, neither this nor that. So, you know, neither too much chaos, neither too much order, you, that kind of thing. But they really formulas for liberation um, eventually, the twelfth is the ripeness is all, and the ripeness is all is uh, from Shakespeare's King Lear. It's uh, it's really what I, I think is probably Shakespeare's entire philosophy. And the, I think the quote uh, goes from from a minor character, Edgar, uh, says, "You know, we must endure our coming hence as our going hither. The ripeness is all." And what? Shakespeare saying that we, you know, we have to endure the pain of being born, the pain of being death, and then you say, well, what's the meaning of it all? Going back to Viktor Frankl and, you know, Otto Rank and um, uh, Ernest Becker, is to is to say, well, Shakespeare was a playwright, so he thinks of life as kind of all the world's a stage, and so if uh, you know the lights go on, you're born, you have this little life, and then you die. What's the meaning of that? Well, you make a good show out of it. You, you know, the the thing is good theater. And so it's the only tragedy in life, I think, is what Shakespeare is saying is if you die, you know, unripe, and then in other words, too, you know, unwise and not having experienced life, kind of leave stuff on the table, leave a life unlived. Uh, that's one tragedy. The other tragedy is getting, you know, getting a bit uh, too jaded and living too long getting overripe that's also a bit of a tragedy it's kind of like <laughs> so somewhere in the middle is this idea that uh, perfect ripeness you know, wisdom and understanding of life a good show uh, that you put on in your in your life um, is a good way to die and somewhere buried in that idea is the greek idea of ataraxia so there was a concept of uh, ataraxia in ancient Greece, um, hard for us to understand, but it's this kind of idea of clean mind, a kind of Zen-like state, which is considered an ideal state for soldiers to go into battle. Um, it's kind of a pure doomed, uh, but equanimous, um, I think that's the right word, um, state of mind, which is, I think, the right way to, to approach death if you actually get the Rightness is all but right. <laughs> so that's the circuit for you. All right, to wrap up, let's uh, go over the enigmatic Project 89 thing, uh, which you suggest has a long history. Could you explain uh, the modern manifestation of it in Project 89 for us? Yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure exactly what Project 89 is. Um, I, uh, the It might be a Christian thing. It has a uh, uh, aspects of Christianity, and there there is something I believe um, that if you if you take the synoptic gospels like from Mark, I think this if you go through them one by one, I think there's sixty nine um, verses uh, or eighty nine verses. Uh, so um, another Freudian slip. Um, so yeah, uh, the the actual project though it it ran from like 2009 to 2012 and then Cicada 3301 started I th I think they are related though I'm not uh, absolutely sure I, I'm not, I don't know who the the Cicada 3301 guys are but uh, in essence if you look at that document. It's the same thing that's uh, been going on since the Rosa Christians. Well, actually, if you go through the mystery cuts, it goes all the way back to shamanism, I think. 
you, you can see the skull cults in Gobekli Tepe and they must be doing the same kind of thing. And it's, it's, uh, it's really getting people okay with the, their death. So if you take uh, the very first known bit of literature, which is uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, it, it is the story of Gilgamesh, um, who's a king who wants to be immortal, you know, like Ernest Becker, immortality project. And he sets out to become immortal. Eventually he finds that he can't become immortal and he's okay with that. It's, uh, that's the whole cycle. So the very first bit of literature is the answer to Ernest Becker and to our whole cultish problem. Uh, it's, it's the Epic of Gilgamesh. We, in essence, we, we, I don't think we've really come up with any literature that isn't some version of the Epic of Gilgamesh. <laughs> Anything Disney comes up with Shakespeare or something. It really at its heart is this immortality project that can't be achieved. Therefore, you just become reconciled to your death. And then that's kind of wisdom. And that, that story gets repeated over and over and over again. And so, yeah, I think, uh, I think that's what Project 89 is, is, is about. Um, it is on a broader scale. So it's the idea that we can do this collectively now. So we do the Epic of Gilgamesh, not just <clears throat> as, as an individual, now we can do it as a collective. And the result is this kind of epiphany. It, it has a striking resemblance to the rapture of the nerds or the technical singularity. But the te technical singularity is, is uh, based on dead stuff, I would call it. It's all technology. And, uh, they, and you know, it's kind of Elon Musk and uh, those guys are on the path to the, um, Steven Pinker and those guys are on the path to the rapture of the nerds. Great um, way of civilization. Thing. Yeah, but, but this is a psychological tipping point where we, we all, you know, become uh, self-realized and you know into this garden of eden i don't think it's going to happen i think we all toast long before then but it's a nice idea <laughs> yes uh, certainly um so on that note you're of the opinion that humanity has failed and that effectively we are about to be aborted uh that was very intriguing to me as you've uh, committed to going down fighting so can you explain your uh, philosophy of quote unquote heroic exist of resistance in the face of extinction well it is actually in the epic of gilgamesh is is i uh, you know to actually get meaning out of it you go back to the ancient greeks and look at uh at the literature there and how the story is repeated. And, you know, we can't actually be certain about how this, it doesn't look good. I mean, it's certainly, you know, if you look at the Arctic and the rate, the pace of change, uh, it doesn't look good at all. So uh, you say, well, what, how do you approach it? How do you actually deal with it? And I think the smart thing to do, I mean, if you were on the Titanic, you at least to start off with you you should behave as if you don't know you don't want to you know prematurely say this titanic is going to sink so you carry on as if it's not going to sink even though you're pretty sure it is um and in in that action you kind of think in terms of of doing right action so part of the desiderata extinctionality is one of the one of the things is is to just do right action for its own sake everybody's you know egotistical and looking for a, a result but really if we're heading in, into collapse you shouldn't really at the best of times care about the results um, and you should just do the right thing that's a forgotten concept <laughs> so you know i think the to give meaning to collapse if we're heading into collapse is not to get into this prepping mode and try and survive it i think the best way of surviving it if anybody survives is uh, you know basically the kind of the meek will inherit the earth. It's it's people without an ego, uh, have mutual support, and really don't care either way. A large part of the reason why cults go bad is is people care about the outcome. If they ever just gave up, and if the whole world just completely lost hope, that would be our saving. But uh, unfortunately, people care too much, and they care about the outcome. And in, in pursuing that outcome, immortality. They achieve the opposite. 
So it's it's basically a question is let go. If you just let, let go, we'll be way better off than if you keep on fighting. Yeah, I was just so, thinking that uh, in your premise, the Mormon church is definitely uh, headed for a beating then. I think it's like members are required to put aside like 10% of their income or something like that for the end of the world. I mean, they're encouraged to stock up on, you know, all kinds of disaster supplies and food and uh, it's pretty pervasive. Uh, yeah, they, they have uh, emergency supplies, um, extraordinary warehouses full of them. So whenever there's a disaster like Katrina, um, the FEMA didn't do much in Katrina, but the, the Church of the Latter-day Saints, they sent trucks down and they did, uh, the, you know, the relief operation that the, that the US government failed to do. So they, they have tremendous preparation uh, for that. The, the 200 billion war chest that they have is from people tithing. But tithing is a very old thing. Um, it's, uh, it's kind of standard. If, if you go to an ashram in India and join a, you know, some kind of, get a guru, they, they, will, they will tithe and take, take a tithe. It's kind of uh, traditionally a medieval thing as well as tithing to the church. Uh, before we wrap up, actually, could you get into your um, your whole thoughts on consciousness? Because um, as I understand it, you don't really uh, necessarily believe it's a thing, right? Oh, yeah. No, I mean, I think it's it's the only thing, isn't it? <laughs> like, it's the, the only thing you can really be sure of is that we are here and now, right? Having this conversation, you can't really be a lot, you know, sure about more than that, surely. So it's the one thing that that we actually know what it is what is consciousness the hard problem of consciousness is it's completely baffling it's, it's like quantum theory is like nobody can you know begin to understand you know embodied consciousness because part of it is identity is it like if you say well i'm conscious there's no big deal there's you know electricity in my head and axons firing and so weird. you have the problem of identity is why are you this person and not the person over there <laughs> it's like it's baffling. It's absolutely baffling. And why? Why do the lights go on when you're born, and then you presume that it goes lights out, and that's it? It's just you know, there's eternity of darkness, and this brief flicker which we call life. It's just absurd. <laughs> Anybody that thinks they know what's going on, I think, is um, doesn't have um, have any sense of mystery at all. Well, thank you, Lord Hugh. This has been absolutely fascinating. Uh, did you have anything you wanted to plug here before we wrap up? Uh, yeah, so just, uh, can I hear more about your project and just uh, your angle on the, you know, because everybody has some some sort of angle on, on the work that they're doing. Uh, you you want to divulge yours? <laughs> oh, well, I think you're, since basically I'm good at it, I think. Uh, I mean, it's something that I've always kind of enjoyed doing, uh, being a researcher and so forth. Um, I think partly I was always kind of obsessed with private detective movies as a child. So I've kind of found a way to uh, do that without uh, necessarily uh, working for some kind of nefarious company or something to that effect. <laughs> But um, I don't know. I've always been fascinated by history. And um, more than anything, I think, as uh, time has gone on, it's become just fascinating to me with the networking I've been able to do. I get to meet all kinds of interesting people. I get to learn lots of new ideals and be exposed to many things that I would not otherwise uh, be. So I think it's also helped me uh, grow as a person. Um, my research partner, Keith Allen Dennis, is a big believer in the kind of concept of personal arcana you know, kind of finding uh, whatever it is that naturally comes to you that brings uh, meaning and uh, let's just say spirituality into your life. And um, I think in my case, it was probably the art of memory. I've never really formally studied it, but I, uh, I think I've always kind of known how to do it on a certain level. So this all sort of contributes to that. Yeah, so yeah, the Ars Memoria uh, is, is what you're talking about. So that is- Like I said, part I can't talk. So. Yeah, that was, that was part of the tradition in, in my cult was, was that the, the idea that it's, it's an ancient Greek idea from the Pythagorean school and also Plato and Socrates is that there was a golden age and what people are doing with philosophy is rediscovering it. So they, they thought in terms of, you know, you have to remember um, and then they had all memory techniques, but they, it's kind of degenerated now to, you know, oh, 
how to improve your memory kind of, <laughs> which is not what it was. It was try, how, how to get back uh, to consciousness and wisdom through uh, recalling it, rediscovering it through memory. Yes, I certainly try to do aim more for the uh, more traditional uh, version of it than the uh, pop psychological version. Um, but I mean, also, I think it was kind of the concept too that is, uh, you know, you acquired more knowledge. Uh, I gave you maybe a more complete view, something that was more closer to a spiritual view, if you will. What, what's your view on like Aleister Crowley and Blavatsky and that side of uh, cults? Well, I think theosophy was just disastrous on so many levels. I mean, I think the whole concept of the secret chiefs really uh, inspired a lot of fanatical political ideologies and so forth. Um, Crowley, the man, I think, in some ways, his lifestyle, you know, you can find uh, certain things in it that were very useful. I mean, for instance, in my case, uh, one of the things that he had advocated that um, I'm kind of a big fan of is that you should read at least one publication a day by, you know, from an ideology or a worldview that you just absolutely despise, uh, because that exposes you to different ideals, you know, I mean, it's kind of how you grow as a person. Uh, I think that's one of the big mistakes a lot of people make is they just sort of exist in an echo chamber and just uh, acquire media that reinforces their worldview. Whereas I think in this case, Crowley was advocating trying to challenge your worldview. And I think that's actually a very good ideal. So I think there's some positive things with Crowley. On the other hand, though, I, uh, I try not to buy into too much of the hysteria around him. Um, but I do think that, again, Thelema could be taken to uh, be a very authoritarian ideology. Yeah, they do tend to be authoritarian. There's mm. an authoritarian it's almost a kind of a Darwinistic that... worldview. Yeah, there's an authoritarian streak that runs through a lot of the stuff, even Project 89 and uh, uh, Sakata 3301. Um, if you like Assassin's Creed seems to be those, those guys seem to um, have connections. Um, and underneath it all, it's it gets fast quite quick. I, th I think there was just a scandal in Ubisoft, the guys, the company that, that did uh, Assassin's Creed. And it's essentially because it's kind of boys culture but <laughs> like QAnon and all of these things they they do tend to be a right wing um hitler uh you know had a big occult side um which is very interesting but uh that that kind of uh, blood and soil um and the, the theosophical society eventually you know becomes a bit fash <laughs> yeah some of it even gets very odd. I mean, we, of course, just did a podcast on the, uh, you know, the whole roots that the uh, modern UFO contactee movement really has in theosophy with, uh, you know, people like George Anamnensky and George Hunt Williamson. And um, again, though, a lot of that stuff, I mean, ultimately kind of uh, drifts into some dark stuff later, though. I mean, well, gosh, George Hunt Williamson, I think, finally became convinced that he was uh, the king of Serbia or something like that, became a fanatical anti-communist. Um, just... <laughs> Yeah. Right. Uh, what about um, Skinwalker Ranch and Bigelow and you know oh, 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 uh, Skinwalker Ranch. I definitely, uh, I think that was a massive psychological operation. Um, yeah, I've had a, done quite a bit of research on that, and uh, I've spoken to some people involved with that. So yeah, I definitely think that there were some very sketchy things going on with that. And uh, Bigelow, well, I mean, the guy's you know uh, a Las Ve made his uh, fortune as a Las Vegas uh, real estate uh, tycoon, which is typically a polite way of saying that he laundered money. So um... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, interesting stuff. Yeah. Uh, and then that kind of ties into all the weird Mormon stuff, too, because, again, a lot of this, of course, now the current owner of Skinwalker Ranch, uh, Fogel, I think his name is, I mean, he's uh, big in the LDS. And I mean, as I said, a lot of these guys kind of backing uh, some of the modern UFO stuff, like Fermage is another one who's kind of come back lately. I mean, he's another Mormon. So it's uh, it's really odd when you look at that whole milieu. And then, of course, um, 
uh, Harry Reid was the guy who got the funding for Bigelow for the, uh, you know, kind of quasi government uh, sponsorship of his uh, research. I mean, Reid's another Mormon. So uh, also in there in Nevada. So yeah, there's this just uh, Utah, odd, Utah. Yeah, Utah. yeah, yeah. There's just this whole odd milieu of Mormons and organized crime and just these sort of uh, confidence men slash ex intelligence officers and that, uh, you know, whole field with Skinwalker and those types of things well uh, you know joseph smith was the original con man yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> not surprisingly <laughs> he's left a legacy <laughs> yeah yeah well i mean i suppose you could even draw some parallels with crowley for that matter too i mean certainly uh he was used by uh, british intelligence a time or two in his day um actually came into contact if i remember correctly now with the uh the ace of spies sydney riley i mean that was another con man par excellence <laughs> Yeah, uh, and the, there's also the Jack Parsons connection. And oh, yeah, the, yeah, now Ron uh, Hubbard. And, yeah. yeah. You know, it's kind of interesting. Did you know that cybernetics actually played a role in uh, establishing Scientology? I didn't know that. What, what's uh, L. Ron Hubbard? Well, see, there was John W. Campbell, um, who owned, gosh, I can't remember. It was one of the big magazines for the golden age of science fiction. Campbell's mainly known for writing the short story, Who Goes There, I think is what it's called, which was later adapted into the thing, uh, both versions, but especially the John Carpenter one. But he published a lot of the major authors of the golden age of science fiction, such as uh, Robert A. Heinlein and Arthur C. Clarke and Isaac Asimov. And he knew Heinlein and um, Asimov quite well. And uh, through Heinlein was how he came into contact with Hubbard. Hubbard started submitting stories to have uh, you know, published in his magazine. And eventually he turned over this early version of uh, Dianetics to uh, Campbell. And uh, it was more you know, kind of based on you know, the kind of typical theosophical currents of the time. Campbell said, kid, you know, I think you might have something here, but um, I have an idea. See, Campbell, he had gone to, um, I believe it was MIT, and he had gotten to know uh, Norbert Weiner there, uh, who's considered by a lot of people one of the founders of cybernetics. And uh, he started bringing in a lot of these cybernetic concepts into what became Scientology. And then when uh, Hubbard first up started putting um, Dianetics out there, he got uh, some of the early uh, cyberneticists, such as uh, Warren McCulloch, I think his name was, and a few yeah, of the yeah, guys McCulloch, to promote yeah. it. So, um, he was head of the Macy. He was chairman of the Macy. Yeah, Fundo. yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Um, it was it's really fascinating to me how you had that whole sort of milieu with these science fiction authors uh and then also these uh people who are kind of tied into the early cybernetics movement kind of crafting this ideology and then you know L, or, excuse me robert a heinlein too i mean he knew jack parsons and of course he went on to uh write stranger in a strange land which was huge in establishing the counterculture of the 1960s i mean the uh, the church of all world for instance uh the really prominent neo pagan cult i mean was totally based off of stranger in a strange land so um it's really just fascinating from that kind of circle of sci-fi authors i mean they had such a big influence on shaping uh, some of the counterculture and so forth and then just the role science fiction has had in the modern era in general in crafting the world we live in yeah i, I think there was a generation yeah. of the counterculture movement in the 60s um everybody from uh, Terence McKenna and Timothy Leary and those guys, and they uh, they all kind of boomers uh, older than me. They, all that generation kind of uh, not they haven't quite died off all of them yet, but they all kind of got old and uh, <laughs> and stopped being active. And all the things that you see today in terms of um, cult behaviors from QAnon um, to um, Sakata thirty three oh one and uh, all of these things are uh, the next generation. All, all of these oh, guys yeah. are the guys that came came after. Of, you know, often um, younger younger kids, sometimes even kids of the, the originals. Yeah. So we see we, this is the second. We're living in the second generation, um, and uh, it's it's really interesting because a lot of the kids today are being influenced. Um, without the, there again, you know, what I was talking about, a cult, um, you know, recreates itself, and uh, 
that seems to be happening again. Uh, the the younger people, especially what I notice in, in Extinction Rebellion, they, they apparently have a blind spot about the counterculture movement of the 60s. And so they're recreating it without realizing it. A, a, a watered down version. It's not, it's not as cool as it was back in the day, <laughs> but they're on the same path. Did you notice that? Yeah, no, I could definitely see it. Well, I mean, I think, you know, specifically because, uh, well, especially, I mean, Discordianism, I mean, had such a huge influence on cyber culture and kind of the hacker culture in general. So, um, you know, there's definitely that kind of obvious transfer point. And, you know, I kind of think now you see it with like the QAnon stuff. Um, it's kind of interesting, too, how is, you know, the counterculture sort of became the establishment. It's like, conversely, the right has turned around and started to adopt the techniques that the counterculture used used to use against it so yeah I, I, that's uh, that's what amazes me is that i i had to pinch myself uh, with the you know capital riot is the insurrection actually but uh you know there you have people like michael moore who's like the, the doyen of the left and he's saying like you know our capital how dare they come and invade our capital i thought like hang on a minute this is the wrong way around. The left is supposed to be invading the capital. Oh, I, it's and all the, the conservatives are supposed to be saying, our oh, capital, our oh, democracy, how dare they? It's no, like, I mean, the left is coming out and supporting the CIA and just, it's like, what is going yeah. on here? But, but again, this is, goes back to my point. Is do you, you see how cults, um, you know, you, everything is Heraclitus. Everything becomes its opposite in the end. Yes, so everything yes. Everything goes full circle, yeah. Uh, no, it's very true. I mean, when you can definitely see, uh, I mean, I think especially, you know, like I was kind of getting at, I mean, when you look at how the counterculture really kind of transformed into the cyber culture and that whole sort of, you know, anarcho-libertarian current uh, from the 90s really morphed into the surveillance valley of uh, the post 9-11 era, I mean, uh, without a lot of moral qualms about it. So Yeah, and then anonymous as well. I mean, okay, but yeah, uh, do, you, do you know um, anything about the Shadow Brokers? Uh, I've seen it a few times, but no, I'm not especially knowledgeable about that topic. So, yeah, the, the Shadow Pro, it's either one guy or a group, um, uh, but the Shadow Brokers has been really, really important since about 2016. And that's, that's a uh, a little gem of a story that um, is not really in the public uh, attention. But uh, yeah, I, I think, uh, I believe uh, that the 2016 election was, was hacked by, by the shadow brokers. So basically Trump is a creation of the, the shadow brokers. Yeah, um, I believe that was the, one of the premise in the book I just read, Active Measures. Um, a history of disinformation if i'm not mistaken was the title um but yes 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 no I, that was like one of the first times i think i had seen reference to the shadow brokers so yeah that will be uh an interesting thread to see how that develops yeah yeah have a look. so it's um either group or one guy who worked for the nsa and essentially eviscerated the nsa the nsa was a mess i still think it's not quite back together again after the repercussions um, of the shadow brokers. But uh, also the uh, Bitcoin, um, the run up in 2017, I believe was, uh, I, 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 I don't have a lot of proof, but I, I think that was uh, government state actors bidding for the NSA toolkit, which uh, the shadow brokers put up for auction there's um, a, in Bitcoin. Yeah. I mean, there's so, been a lot of theories about who was behind Bitcoin. I mean, in the beginning, um, I know some of the ones we've speculated about was possibly uh, people connected to the PayPal mafia. Uh, yeah, no, the uh, what's that? Proctor, Proctor, what's his name? Uh, the the um, uh, Napster guy. Uh, is that the guy you mean the PayPal mafia and those guys? Oh, there's a. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. I think I know what you're talking about now. I'm not recalling the name though. But yeah, he's yeah. a libertarian, uh, big on copyright and stuff. No, I, I, from what, from what I know, the, the Bitcoin started in the NSA. It's basically an NSA sting up, and it's it's used to to track, um, you know, illicit transactions, which is hilarious because if you speak to these Bitcoin geeks, 
they say, oh, that's all secure and anonymous. <laughs> like, no, <laughs> it isn't. Those guys, <laughs> those guys are actually. I mean, it's uh, like all that stuff, Tor and Signal, and yeah, I mean, basically all of it. I mean, was essentially NSA type. I mean, surveillance technology. Yeah, I, I'm not sure about Tor. Um, Signal, yeah, but yeah, they, the NSA is notorious for putting these things out. And I think, you know, I think, I think the the satoshi nakamoto is basically it's you know satoshi nakamoto agency sna or <laughs> um nsa if you switch the letters around but i think that's it was a joke um that's that's where where its genesis was anyway yes well again it's uh, another example of how up is down in uh 2021 <laughs> Yeah, and uh, well, I'm working with my group to make it more so because <laughs> the, I think I think the worst thing that could possibly happen is uh, business as usual. Yeah, so no, I agree. anything anything that causes disruption or or causes some kind of break, I think is is very important now. Um, I think it's kind of an all-in bet. We we need we need change. So anything left right whatever <laughs> don't care we just need uh, a breaking moment symmetry breaking um so that uh, we change course it's yeah just, yeah, it's a disastrous course i think i mean yeah the neoliberal order just uh, is not sustainable on any number of levels <laughs> yeah but it, we're stuck in it we, we're stuck in this deadlock i feel on the you know political deadlock and so it's it's got to break one way or another uh, we, we have to move either left or right. We, we, we're heading right down the track to destruction. Yeah, no, that's very true. Well, sir, is there anything else you wanted to uh, go over? No, it's been uh, really interesting to talk to you. I'm glad to, to discover you. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, we have uh, Joseph Tro, Joseph, I'm very sorry if I mispronounced your last name, but you also should probably know I can't speak. So, but anyway, Joseph, thank you for bringing Lord Hugh to my attention. This has been absolutely fabulous. Well, sir, you have a good day now. And uh, with that, I will sign off. Uh, good night and good luck to you 